this is that truck, the same exact truck. This is the prototype. late 1960s to the early 1970s, the big three automakers, GM, Ford, Dodge, they noticed that, hey man, people are really digging these small Japanese mini trucks. What's the deal? We don't even know how to make these. Do the Datsun sport truck tough customer test. Datsun, where the smart money's going. GM's like, well, we own a uh, 30% of Isuzu. Maybe we just uh, slap our brand on their truck and sell it here. And people are like, oh, yeah. It'll haul half a ton. It can deliver gas economy and a low price that probably will surprise you. In 1972, the Isuzu Faster was rebranded as the first ever Chevy Love. In the same year, Ford partnered with Mazda to rebrand the B1600 as the first ever Ford Courier. Check it out against competition. Check out option. Now, of course, Dodge, they were like, man, I don't know about these mini trucks. So they didn't even get into the game until 1979. The great little pickup from Dodge that proves you don't have to look tough to be ram tough. Dodge partnered with Mitsubishi to rebrand the Mighty Backs as the Dodge D50. I recently just picked up a 1985 four-wheel drive D50. We'll save that for a future video. From 1972 to 1974, the Chevy Love remained almost the same. I mean, why mess with perfection? In 1974, they introduced the luxury trim package, the Mikado. It came with a fancy three-spoke steering wheel and striped seats. Now, the big change came in 1976. They changed the front bumper, they changed the engine. Not only that, factory standard disc brakes and a factory optional three-speed automatic. The 1.8 liter Isuzu G180Z was upgraded from reverse flow, which has the intake manifold and the exhaust manifold on the same side of the engine. Not as efficient to a cross flow design like you have in here, where the intake manifolds on the opposite side of the exhaust flow flows right through. You make a whopping five extra horsepower. Now, if you ever plan on getting a Chevy Love, I highly recommend getting a 1976 and newer with the cross flow design. A lot easier to find parts for it. The Love stayed unchanged from 1976 to 1978, where it got another facelift. They changed from the four headlight design to the two headlight design. And they also introduced factory four wheel drive. Now, in 1976, you could get a four wheel drive Love. All you had to do was call up your dealer and say, hey man, I like the Love. I really like if it was four wheel drive. They're like, we got you. Does that truck look familiar? That's the exact truck. See all the white? It used to be white. This is that truck. This is the exact prototype made by four wheel drive engineering. They use it for promotional testing purposes, proof of concept. This was their, hey man, can we even do this? And the answer was hell yeah. This 1976 four wheel drive love has a Spicer 30 front axle and a Dana 20 divorce transfer case. The shock setup is completely whack. They tried to use some of the stock stuff. It doesn't have enough travel. Now I picked this love up four years ago. When I picked it up, I pulled it out of the weeds. The thing was not running. I don't know how many years it was parked. Completely clapped out. The engine had less compression than a dry fart. The interior was basically a mouse farm for Dirty Mike and the boys. It was gross. I had to completely gut it out, fix it. All that's already done. We need to finish this off and make it the ultimate farm and work truck. To do that, we're going to have to fix the suspension. We're going to have to completely redesign how the shocks are mounted up. We're going to have to put in some high capacity cooling. When you got horsepower like that and a tiny radiator, you got to extract that heat. It just runs like crap. Oh, oh, God. It is a piece of shit. So we're going to fix the ignition system as well. That's what's yeah. Sounds like a Subaru. I don't feel like it's like that. You ever heard of Subaru? WRX? something else I'm gonna fix. Oh, yeah, let's stop in the intersection. Smart. Do you see anybody out here? <laughs> I'm trying to do seatbelt safety. This is gonna be your new daily driver, so we gotta make sure it's running good and safe. Yeah. Kinda seems like a piece of shit. The Chevy Love is arguably the most rusted out vehicle left over from the 70s. There's only a small group of people, and I'm, I'm one of the hundred or thousand, man. probably a couple hundred. One of the couple hundred people that would ever even go, man, I kind of like those things. Uh, I want to spend money on it. Most other people are like, what's wrong with you? Everyone without love will 
from cruising down the road and we'll be right behind them drafting you know trying to maintain 70 miles an hour in order to achieve that dream of 70 miles an hour i want to fix the ignition system on this but first I gotta get a process started. I wanna put a stock gas tank back in this in its original location. I got a fuel cell in the back. It's no good. I get air traps, the, the fuel pump, every time I get a low on fuel and it sucks a little bit of air, then I'm dead on the side of the road. And you're sitting there on the side of the road going, ding, 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 ding. You can't get any gas. You gotta undo the gas line. <coughs> you get gas in your mouth. You swallow it, trying to siphon it and get it reprimed. It's a whole thing you wanna avoid. Everything you own is pulled from the scrap heap. It's not all unicorn farts and rainbows. It's not quite the vibration we're looking for. We're gonna off balance this blade just a little bit. Varnish will not filter out. It'll go right through your filter, get in your carburetor, gum it up, gum everything up. It's like a, it becomes dissolved in the gasoline and then it'll re, uh, re solidify and gum up everything. It goes right through your filter. Some methyl ethyl ketone. Oh, for Got a little bad spot over there, but. That won't cause any problem. That is good enough for who it's for. Before we get into converting the system over to an electronic ignition system, let's talk about how this stock ignition system actually works. Start with the coil here. This coil is a resistor type coil. Now, from my understanding, what the resistor is for is, you know, when you're cranking the engine, your voltage drops because of the power required to crank the engine. Your voltage drops down, you know, around 10 volts. There was a problem with coil performance when you were starting the engine, if you had a coil that was set up for 12 volts and your voltage dropped, then you didn't have good spark when you were starting the engine. So what they did is they have coils that are made to run on a lower voltage and you have a resistor. Here's your resistor. This is ignition power to this side. This side obviously tails over to the positive terminal of the coil. You also have this black wire with the blue stripe coming off. It is connected to the starting circuit. It only energizes when you're cranking the engine. And on this side is the ground side. Now the ground side is triggered through your points. They connect, charge a coil, disconnect, send a spark. Connect, charge a coil, disconnect, send a spark. It's actually when the points break that it sends the spark to your distributor and your rotor inside the cap, depending on which cylinder it's pointing at, jumps a gap, sends a spark to your spark plug, explosion, and you go down the road. First step, remove the distributor cap. That's pretty easy. Pull your rotor off. You should disconnect the battery. I'm lazy about that. It's really stupid because I've marked shit out a bunch of times, but I'm still lazy about it. Now the Pertronics will have a ground and a positive wire that needs to come out of this. This other wire goes to your condenser. You will not need that with electronic ignition. I'm going to run my wires through that. These are the two wires that have to pass through there. You can see the grommet here. Fill this out bigger. So hopefully I can fit that grommet and get a little bit of wire tightness. Petronic supplies these nice little countersunk screws. I don't know if it has magnets in it or pieces of metal, but it's what triggers a switch in here. It's contactless. Four sections to sit over your sit over your square cam lobe since this is a four cylinder. Find anything on it, whether it's necessary. I do know the Petronics will run without it, but I ended up running that ground wire to the body of this Petronics triggering unit because it has to ground out the coil. Now there's not much clearance underneath that screw, so I kind of had to get special with it. And uh, you might not need to do that. It might be completely unnecessary. I just did it for peace of mind. We have the start circuit wire taped off. I want to keep that in case I ever want to go back to points. So we just have it taped off so it doesn't short out. Ignition wire on, which is on anytime the key's on, starting or not. Positive, wired to the positive of the Petronics, and negative, wired to the negative of the Petronics. We're all set up and ready to go. All I gotta do is put the distributor cap back on, plug in our coil wire.
I'm not even seeing the knot. So we're gonna go ahead and advance it just a little bit. 12 millimeter. It was way retarded. Right now, It's right at zero and we're about 1100 rpm now i need to let the engine warm up completely before setting the idle speed because uh first you want your choke to be off and your fast idle because that'll throw it off but your engine will idle at a lower rpm when it's cold and the oil thick and then when it warms up it'll idle faster so you want to let it get good and warm before setting your idle speed we get the ignition closed and then we turn the carburetor down to get the idle speed and we kind of go back and forth back and forth until we're really close on both once we got the idle speed, then we'll make sure we set it to the proper ignition advance and uh, Bob Gironti. I forgot to tell you how I was pretty sure it was the ignition because the ignition will tend to... Whereas uh, if it's a carburetor issue, it'll kind of just go... Boom. Four wheeler on the back. We're gonna see if the Protronics fixed uh, my failure to set the ignition points properly. We're getting ready to go up a hill here, and uh, we'll see if it. And I'll just straight up mat it, bog it. We'll see what happens. Okay. You ready? I'm ready. Don't get your feet ran over. I'll try not. any system but I think we'd make it happen. Oh yeah, burn my fingers. Oh yeah, under oh, yeah. There we go. Can we give her a couple more reps really quick. I don't know why I always put the pee pads down after I've already made a mess. I should uh, put them down first and the other way up. It'd work a lot better. But uh, after the first flush here of the OG fluid, you can see I even got a moth. Uh, that might have been in the pan. It might have came out of the radiator. We're not sure. Now I'm just using regular old tap water because uh, distilled water is kind of expensive. And there's going to be multiple iterations of this before we're done. You know, it's got that kind of money. Start her up, make sure all the air bubbles come out. You do that by starting it up, let it warm up, wait until the thermostat opens, and when it opens, you start to see some swirling action in your radiator. As long as the fluid level doesn't suck completely down, you can still see fluid once it's swirling, you know your air bubbles are out. There we go. After the third flush, we probably have most of the coolant out of there. We're probably down to about an eighth original strength 50 50 coolant mix because. It, it doesn't seem to matter what you work on. About half of it stays in the engine every time. So we have it, have it, have it. This time we add water, we'll be down to an eight. That's close enough. Add some of your favorite cooling system cleaner. We're down to water and the cleaning solution only. I like to take it for a 30 minute drive, keep the RPMs high down the highway, get it nice and warm. Let that cleaner do, you know, the best job it can. So we've done two rounds of hot flushes with the cleaner in there. At this point, I like to remove the thermostat. For now, 
take the thermostat out, put your cooling neck back on. Make sure you got more water coming out of here than you got going out of the bottom. As long as it's coming out, it's going to be good. After the water hose flush, I like to flush it twice with distilled or reverse osmosis water. I mean, distilled is probably what people are going to recommend, but you buy a bunch of gallons of distilled, and I have an RO system in the house, so it's the way she goes. 160 degree, new 180 degree. 180 degree that was in the truck. The 160 degree is cracked open slightly. Just hit 180. This one is cracked open. The old one is cracked open. The new one is not yet. Wow. Good angle there. And we're at 191 almost. And the new one's just barely cracked open. The older one's open more, but not a whole lot more. I've been steady around 193 for a while. 160 degree thermostat. New 180. Same brand. Old 180. After doing that little experiment with these thermostats, I'm going with the 160 degree thermostat here. The 180 degree thermostats, they barely cracked open. They were kind of, you know, starting to open up by 190 degrees Fahrenheit, but not even fully open at 203 degrees Fahrenheit. So uh, we're gonna sacrifice a little bit of heater temperature. Might not be able to defrost the windows. The 160 degree Fahrenheit thermostat, she will be running cool. We have some distilled water trapped in the system yet. We're gonna go ahead and pour in concentrate. And I like to use all makes, all models, not the conventional green crap. I don't use that in anything because uh, this lasts longer for longer mileage before the additives break down. So the system capacity is 1.6 gallons. So that means we need to put in 0.8 gallons of concentrate. Oh, f Remember to close your pit cock before you start adding coolant. Sure you probably recognize these little guys coolant testers so you can choose and see if your uh, your block's gonna freeze and bust open i might just be a special idiot but in my experience you fill this up and you're kind of looking for the floaters you watch it and they all kind of they float and then one's got a little air bubble on it so you kind of go like that and then it sinks you're like i don't know so you just keep adding concentrate and eventually you end up at a 80 percent mixture and you're and you just call her a day Long story short, junk. Look at this thing. They just look scientific. Look, use these. These are for science. You don't see anybody using floaty balls and floaty discs for science. This little refractometer, all you do is you make sure this is room temperature. I calibrated this at room temp. Put a little on there. Bink, 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 bink. Oh, I need another bink. Okay, let's close the lid. Negative 38 Celsius. See that blue scale there? Ethylene, negative 38. You think this little dinky fan's good enough for the full 80 horsepower this thing makes? Probably is. It moves around 800 CFM. I went ahead and got a fan that moves 3000 CFM. Well, maybe getting the biggest fan I thought I could fit on there. It's a little bit bigger fan than I can actually fit on there. That fan is three and three eighths deep. The outside diameter of the fan is 16 and a half. If you're a normal person, you probably just grab like a 14 inch fan, slap her on there and call it a day. I've got the 16 inch fan that doesn't fit. We're gonna make it fit. See where it bellows out right there? We're gonna go ahead and just zoop. Hey, look at how good this fan fits. A little bit of clearance in there and a little bit of clearance in on the top. To attach this fan, you got these little zoop zoop things and little things on the back. Just barely doesn't clear. I mean, it clears, but I don't think having the water pump rub a hole inside the back of the fan is going to be a very good deal. Got this strap. I don't know where it came from, but I've got it. I think I'm going to cut this flange off right there. Pop it on there, weld the flange back to it. Watch out, it goes. 
We'll just use washers to space it out. I'm gonna go ahead and center all the way right there. Ended up spacing out the top and tilting the bottom in just a little bit. You can see there, I'm not touching, not touching, not touching. Oh yeah, I got all the clearance. I mean, I got a good 3 16 maybe even a quarter inch there. 3000 CFM fan is gonna straight up move some air. If this thing has any trouble ever getting hot after this, I've got problems. I looked online, you can get these radiator zip ties, they call them, with the springs as a kit, foam, uh, the zip rod, the spring. That's the best way to go. Look at this. See how the foam isolates the fan? I got relative movement there. The fan is not rubbing on this old copper radiator in any way. This little fan kit here from uh, Flexlight. It's pretty trick. Control module. All the electronics are potted, waterproof. Pretty nice. All in one. You don't need an outside relay. You hook your fan up to uh, purple and yellow. And you hook your power up to black and red. And then you've got some trigger pins. You hook one of those up to your ignition so the fan's not running when your key's off. So that triggers it on and it's got a delay. So when you start, your fan doesn't try to come on and rob power from you. Uh, there's other pins for manual fan override on, manual fan override off, AC on. We won't use all those pins. We'll only use three of them. Two for the temperature probe and one for the ignition power on. Probably gonna turn it down just a little bit more. I'd say she said about perfect. regular screen door screen metal I like to put it in front of the radiator i guess you can't really see it you don't want it up against your radiator you want it off of it a little bit that way things kind of go bang 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 kind of like a trampoline if you set your shocks on the ground and then leave a puddle they might be no freaking good before we're going to convince the old lady that this thing rides like a cadillac it's going to need a new set of shocks Those aren't doing anything. The problem is, this truck was never set up properly. They put on the stock shock. No bump stop with this leaf spring up there. The old uh, double A arm suspension, it didn't have much travel to it. This is mounted inward, so it, it didn't travel a whole lot. The bump stop was this. When you use your shock as a bump stop, they don't last very long. This shock has about seven inches of travel. Which is, that's why I have the truck positioned this way. I've got this tire up on a ramp. I've taken that wheel off just like I got there. I got it weighed on this tire and the catty corner tire so I can kind of get a judge for the suspension. This strap will keep this ever from fully extending and being the only thing that's stopping that axle from traveling down further. There's no bump stops on the back. They removed the stock bump stops. So I'm gonna have to put the bump stops on and build a pedestal like this. Where to set the bump stop, how tall to make the pedestal. It's all gotta be figured out. Let's make a mark up here. The bottom of the stroke. About 7.4 inches of total shock travel, which is about perfect for what I've got front and back. These also have about 7.4 inches of travel. If we're doing four inches of down travel, it'd be set somewhere around right here at ride height. I put these in some time ago because this thing would bottom out hard against those shocks and it was just rough riding. These bump stops really made it smooth. You don't even feel when it engages the bump stop. Engage the bump stop about there. It will allow for, you know, two inches of bump stop engagement. Thing here is a rebound limiter. It hits, keeps that from rocking forward, and kind of limits the rebound. This should represent close to maximum downward travel. And right now we're sitting at about six and three quarters inches of stroke, so we should have almost a half of an inch of stroke left down travel. that junk set my upward travel at four and a half inches i'll leave my downward travel at three inches the bracket this thing measures about 21 21 and a quarter minus our three inches of downward travel gets us 18 and a half 18 and a half inches which is right here so i need to extend this bracket an inch and a half upwards since this is all gobbled up we're just going to cut here cut here <laughs> I'm
my own world of make-believe Kids screaming in the cradles, profanities I see the world through ice covered in pink and Cross out the ones who help my cries and watch me weep I love everything Are you spreading all around me? My world's so bright It's hard to breathe, but that's alright Hush since we extendo cocked this thing by about four inches, it might be a bit more flimsy, more apt to bend, you know, because we're going to be jumping this thing. So we're going to use a piece of angle iron in here just like that. Give it a flange on both sides. Not too bad for a Uno Reverso weld, huh? This is a cantilever design. It would basically mount like that. It only bolts on one side. I made these three parts on the plasma table. Well, the Bilstein B6 HD shocks are in. Since I have the jounce, the rebound, the bump stops all set correctly to where this isn't bottom out. Maybe it'll last more than 500 miles like this thing did. It's actually a rebound limiting strap. When the springs go down, these want to separate and they hit there and it limits the rebound to the extent. You can jack this up, support it by the frame and just let the suspension hang. That should be pretty close to your max downward jounce too. And we just want to get a, a reference measurement here. And here I'm measuring about 12 and a half. She's up a little bit now because of the way I have the front end down, but when she's balanced at right height, she's about nine and a half. Normally on a love, this axle will be on top of the spring and this plate will be on the bottom of the spring. This has been flipped around for increased ride height. So this plate is normally down here. So we've already got short suspension travel on this shock. These shocks have bottomed out and just bent the hell out. Yeah, completely bent. Everything bent from these bottoming out, not having enough travel. More like 30 degrees, they don't get near as much damping. An easy way to think about the shock efficiency is go to the extreme here. You're going to have one to one travel versus completely horizontal. You're going to have none. So 45 degrees, you have about 50% It's position. Now it's doing about 60% of the damping it would normally do, which allows this back in to bounce around quite a bit. We're going to mount the shock to the axle, make a bracket up there on the frame. So she's straight up and down your muffler, uh, cooking your shock. That doesn't work very good. It's junk. Zion and drew up these brackets in SolidWorks and blew them out on the plasma. I think they turned out pretty trick. You might be like, well, what the hell are those going to mount to? This tube is going to come off of the axle. That's going to go on the end of the tube. It's going to go on the tube like that. Shock will go right in there. Just like that. Don't eat that. That's rubber. Don't eat the wood over there either. You know the wood makes you throw up, okay? Don't eat that stuff. Don't eat that stuff. I also designed this little thing. You'd be like, what the hell is that? I have the diameter for the axle tube offset by the radius of my plasma tip here. Huh? Make a sense? Almost looks store-bought. Better store bot. And I got the shock mocked up where it's gonna go using a eighth inch plate up there to keep it off of the bed here. You know, going up as high as possible. Got my bracket held up on a jack stand. And that's what it's gonna look like. Using the level, get her straight up and down, side to side, back and forth. Fortunately, I gotta pull it back out of here. So we gotta kind of surface prep this metal for welding there and there. Lower and bottom tacked in place. Did it at ride height, that's important. As your suspension travels, you know, the spring pivots, this shock will get in a little bit of a bind in both extremes. You want it in the most relaxed position at ride height, and that goes for when you're installing shocks too. You want to tighten down the bolts and everything at ride height. I made these little bump stop pedestals. Here.
This bump stop will engage in two inches and will have two inches of overall upwards travel once the bump stops engage before the uh, shock will bottom out. She's all installed. We ended up with about three and a half inches of rebound and about four inches of jounce or up travel. Well, I cut off the muffler. Let's see how it sounds. <laughs> Here's a muffler. Pretty much brand new. I salvage out of the white love, if you remember that video. And that's where those bump stops came from. Beautiful. Wow, that was too quiet. That's the, uh, the fuel pump, uh, you just call it the sending unit, but the sending unit is I don't know, I guess technically it's still the sending unit. You guys correct me in the comments what it's actually called. The float is on the other end of this plate here. It's in the tank there, and it's got an arm with variable resistance. And I'm testing the resistance here. I've got it on ohms. You can see here at full empty, it's reading about 120. I'm gonna manually sweep the float up with a screwdriver. So it looks like 120 to 20 is a sweep for this float. We're gonna connect that. To the filler neck out of a piece of a uh, generic fuel filler hose. The yellow wire with the red stripe. Let's see if I got lucky. This is gonna be amazing. I won't have to carry around a gas can as a reserve tank. Might not look like much, but these mineral tubs are 250 pounds a piece. We're going down the highway, hauling 2,000 pounds, fully loaded, fully matted. It's not overheating yet. I've only been able to hit 55 miles an hour. The nose is kind of pointing in the air. She's a little light on the steering. I don't know which direction the wind's blowing today, but I've now hit 58 miles an hour. The rear springs are just barely off of the bump stops. If we hit any little bump, they're hitting the bump stops. Shit, I don't know about brakes. No. Next intersection. Factory standard disc brakes. And now we're on the country road. I'm still fully mad in second gear. This rough road will be a good test of the suspension with a full load on it hitting those bump stops. <laughs> I really think 